हरिओम विल टॉक अबाउट द डाइजेस्टिव सिस्टम द ह्यूमन डाइजेस्टिव सिस्टम एंड द प्रोसेस ऑफ डाइजेशन ऑल्सो वी विल टॉक सम रेफरेंस अबाउट द योगिक प्रैक्टिस इन रिलेशन विद द डाइजेस्टिव सिस्टम नो डाइजेशन द टर्म डाइजेशन इट इन्वॉल्व टू प्रोसेस इट्स अ केमिकल प्रोसेस एंड इट्स अ मैकेनिकल प्रोसेस द फूड वॉट एवर वी कंज्यूम इट मे बी फ्रूट्स इट मे बी वेजिटेबल्स इट मे बी ब्रेड इट मे बी एनी सब्सटेंस एनी फूड सब्सटेंस विच वी ईट that needs to be processed so that our body cells they can produce energy out of it our body cells they produce energy from the food but then the food which we eat is a complex structure and this complex structure of food needs to be broken down into simpler form of food or the food what we eat is in a large molecular size and this large molecules they need to be broken down into smaller molecules so that the body cells they can produce energy out of it and this process of breaking down the food is done in two ways it's a chemical process and it's a mechanical process or it's a chemical and physical process and once the process is completed our body absorbs that food and then it is utilized for the process of energy production so digestion is one important function of the digestive system but apart from that there are other functions of the digestive system like ingestion like consume the food chewing the food then swallowing the food and then of course the main part digestion of the food but once the food is digested to absorb it into our blood stream into our body and the last part is to throw out the unwanted undigested excess food what we have consumed so excretion it's removing of the unwanted food from our body so all these processes carried out into our digestive system so to carry out all these functions there are various organs there are various parts of the digestive system so in a sequence the digestive system it starts from the mouth then it is the throat which is a common passage for the air to go into the trachea or the vent tube and the food enter into the esophagus or the food tube so from the throat the next part which starts is the esophagus or in simple language we can call it as the food tube then the most important part of the digestive system the stomach which continues further as the small intestine then the large intestine and the last part is the rectum now this digestive system is a continuous single tube made up of involuntary muscles so from the throat till the rectum it's a single tube having different diameter at different levels but then it is made up of involuntary muscles so we don't have control over the muscles of this digestive system they function automatically they function on their own these are in short the organs of the digestive system the parts of the digestive system and this is a sketch for our understanding about the digestive system so as we said it starts from the mouth which has been mentioned here as the oral cavity then esophagus then the stomach you can notice that the stomach is slightly towards the left side of the body then this stomach is connected further with the small intestine which is placed centrally 
and then this small intestine connects with the large intestine. Now the connection of the small intestine with the large intestine, it's on the right side of our body and it is in the lower part of the abdomen. And precisely the large intestine, it runs from the lower part to the upper part on the right side. Then it travels from the right side towards the left side. And then again on the left side, it descends down. So the parts of the large intestine, they are the ascending colon or the large intestine, which is on the right side. Then the transverse colon or the large intestine which goes from the right side to the left side and then the descending colon or the part which is on the left side. And of course it continues in the rectum. One more structure you can see here is the liver. Now the liver you can see is on the right side of the human body. It's a huge organ, it's a large organ, important for the process of digestion, important for the process of metabolizing the food and also important for the process of detoxification. So liver, a huge organ on the right side of the body and just below the liver you can see a small structure, the gallbladder. Now this is a bag, it's a muscular bag which stores the secretions of the liver. The liver is functional 24 hours a day, but then the secretions, they may not be needed by the process for the process of digestion. So they are stored in this gallbladder and whenever necessary, these uh, secretions of the liver, they come into the digestion. So this is in short about the parts of the digestive system, the sketch of the digestive. One more structure which you might have noticed is behind the stomach, behind the small intestines and it is called as the pancreas. So this pancreas, it is also a gland which is related with the insulin secretion and controlling the blood sugar level in our body. Now as I said earlier, the digestive system, the digestive tract is a single continuous muscle tube and these muscles, they are the involuntary muscles. So if we have a cross section of our digestive tract, if we just cut the digestive system at any level, we would have three layers which are seen. The innermost layer is the mucosa layer or in simple language, the mucus. So the sticky slimy substance in our digestive system, it's called as the mucus, which is the protective layer of our digestive system. It protects our digestive system. It protects the muscles of our digestive system from any friction with the food, from the digestive juices, from the digestive enzymes. And then just below that mucosa is the submucosa where we have all the digestive glands. Small glands which produce the digestive juices which help in the process of digestive juices and at the same time this submucosa it has a very rich blood supply to absorb the digestive food. So secretion of digestive juices is in the submucosa layer and at the same time the absorption of food is through this submucosa layer and through the submucosa layer, it enters into the bloodstream, the blood circulation of our body. And then the next is the layer of muscles. And with the help of these muscles, the contraction and relaxation of these muscles, we are capable of pushing the food in one direction. Or the food moves in one direction because of the muscular movement of our digestive system. So from the esophagus, the food goes to the stomach, from the stomach to the small the intestine, then the large intestine. So it moves in one direction because of this muscular layer.
and the last one the outermost is called as the seroza which is just a protective layer it's a sheath of fibers which protects the muscular layer the mucus layer the submucus layer so these are the layers of the digestive system if you cut through the digestive system in a cross section it would look it would look something like this now talking about the various parts of the digestive system the significance of various parts of our digestive system or the most important functions of the various parts of the digestive system beginning with the mouth is the starting point of our digestive system and we all are very well aware that our digestive system it has the teeth the gums the tongue the main part of it and here the main function which is carried out in the mouth is basically a mechanical function of chewing the food and breaking it down into smaller and smaller pieces so in the mouth we are actually chewing the food breaking it down into smaller particles smaller pieces and when we are doing it the food is mixed with saliva now saliva is the liquid which is continuously secreted in our mouth through the salivary glands so the salivary glands there are three pairs of the salivary glands which produce saliva throughout the day and this saliva it mixes with the food of course with the help of the tongue the food is mixed with the saliva and the other function of the tongue is to help in the process of swallowing and to help of course for the sensation of taste and also in the process in the function of speech now when this saliva is mixed with the food the food actually some part of it can be digested in the mouth itself so it is important that we chew the food for a long duration of time because saliva is the first digestive juice which is secreted in the first part of our digestive system the mouth so if you go on chewing the food for a longer duration of time it is possible for us to change the food into a paste like substance into a semi liquid like of substance and at the same time the saliva will help to digest a part of the uh, of the food so if you chew the food properly the digestion of the food it will start in the mouth itself so for human beings chewing the food grinding the food is very very important and so we have very strong molar teeth or the teeth which are at the side of our jaw they are very strong in human beings because grinding is the main function chewing is the main function of our teeth and then for that we need strong teeth which are able to grind the food so do remember that the more you chew the food the possibility of digesting the food increases so chewing the food is very important we should not eat the food in a hurry and just without chewing swallowing it will be a trouble for your stomach so chewing the food is very very important now once the chewing is completed we swallow the food and then from our throat part it enters into our esophagus and one important mechanism here is that the food enters only into the esophagus only into the food pipe and it doesn't enters into our trachea it doesn't enter into our windpipe that's because there is a structure in our throat the epiglottis and this it closes 
the opening of our wind pipe so that no food no water enters into our wind pipe it enters only into our esophagus it's a process which involves both voluntary and involuntary control the initial stage is a voluntary control but later on it's an involuntary control over this process and momentarily when we are swallowing momentarily when we are swallowing the food swallowing water swallowing any liquid the breathing process stops for a fraction of a second till the food enters into the esophagus now once the food is swallowed it enters into the esophagus the food tube and this food tube it connects the throat with the stomach it's just a long muscular tube and with the contractions and relaxations of this tube the food gets down into the stomach roughly it takes around 7 to 8 seconds for solids and around 2 to 3 seconds for liquids to enter into our stomach now actually there is no digestion of food in the esophagus there is no processing of food in the esophagus the only function of the esophagus is to get the food down into the stomach with the muscular contractions and relaxations now once the food enters into the stomach the main part of digestion it starts for this digestion it takes around roughly 3 hours to complete the process of digestion of course it depends on what food you have consumed like whether you have consumed too much of proteins or too much of fats it would require a bit more time but if it's more of carbohydrates it would require less time so depending on the quantity depending on the components of the food it would take roughly 3 hours for the process of digestion to be completed and this food uh, the sorry this stomach is a bag which is an elastic muscular bag as we said earlier the digestive tract is made up of muscles so similarly the stomach is also made up of muscles they are elastic muscles and the capacity of this bag this elastic muscular bag can be roughly 2 liters like at a time you can consume up to 2 liters of fluid that's on an average roughly it can be measured up to 2 liters it depends on individual capacity but on an average 2 liters of food we are talking in terms of liters because when the food enters into the stomach it's mixed up with the saliva it's like a paste it's like a liquid so we are measuring it the capacity in terms of liters so it's around 2 liters now when i say that the food remains in the stomach for 3 hours and the process of digestion goes on it's important to note that when the stomach is functioning when the stomach is digesting food the blood circulation towards the stomach is increased there is a simple logic in our body that whichever organ is functioning more the blood circulation towards that organ is increased so immediately after food when the stomach is functioning when the stomach is digesting the food the blood circulation is directed more towards the stomach so that the digestive glands in the stomach they can secrete the digestive juices in required quantities now this is one of the important reason why yogasan practice is contraindicated immediately after food yogasan and pranayam practice is contraindicated immediately after food and the reason is the blood circulation now if you start practicing yogasan and when the food is in your stomach 
with the yogasan practice your various body parts body organs the muscles they will start demanding blood because the muscles are working they would say we need blood we need oxygen so in this situation the blood supply which was directed towards the stomach for the process of digestion it will be redirected towards your joints your muscles and the other active organs and parts of your body so the stomach will get less blood supply the stomach will get less amounts of blood circulation around it so there would be less production of digestive juices and digestive enzymes so if you practice yoga san immediately after food it will lead to indigestion you cannot digest the food properly this is one of the reason why yoga san practice is not to be done when your stomach is full yoga san practice is always to be done when your stomach is empty or at least after 3 hours once you have completed your meals second reason for this contraindication is as i mentioned earlier stomach is an elastic muscular bag and in this elastic muscular bag after food we have liquid the maximum capacity is 2 liters so just imagine that there is a bag muscular bag full of liquids and then you are squeezing the bag by bending forwards bending backwards turning twisting what would happen to this muscular bag and the liquid inside the bag actually unnecessarily you are churning and you are actually squeezing the bag which can cause to lose the elasticity of the so there is a possibility that the muscular elasticity of the stomach muscles will go on reducing if you go on practicing various yogasan after eating food and when the elasticity goes on reducing the process of digestion will also slow down so this is the second reason why yogasan practice is contraindicated when you have food in the stomach and the third important reason is immediately after food the level of awareness it slightly reduces one of the reasons is that the blood circulation is more towards the stomach so the level of awareness would slightly reduce and yogasan practice is all about improvement in your awareness so in that condition you will not be aware or the level of awareness would not be more because there is food in the stomach the blood is going towards the stomach and with less levels of awareness you should not be practicing yoga for these reasons yoga san practice is contraindicated immediately after food you should wait for at least 3 hours after you consume food and then you can practice yoga san so the best time when your stomach is empty the best time to practice yoga san would be morning hours because at that time your stomach is definitely empty you have not taken any food throughout the night so the stomach is empty 
and then morning hours definitely you can practice yoga that's the best time to practice yoga so this was what i was saying the storage of food for 3 hours storage is basically digestion of food for 3 hours and then digesting the proteins and fats in the stomach that's the function of stomach and then after this is done the food it will enter into your small intestine now the main part or the main function of the small intestine is absorption of food so small intestine technically actually the length is larger the length is bigger but then as the diameter is smaller it is called as a small intestine now the length is long the length is bigger just because the function of the small intestine is absorption of food so the longer the distance the longer the tube more amount of food can be absorbed so the length of the large uh, the length of the small intestine is longer which facilitates the absorption of food and furthermore the innermost layer of the small intestine the mucosa as we mentioned earlier it is folded so that the surface area increases so more the surface area more the absorption of food and then from the small intestine the food is absorbed now uh, you can call it as a liquid actually it's a liquid the food from the small intestine enters into our blood stream so it's actually a liquid and the part which remains in the small intestine is the unwanted food is the undigested food various bacteria the digestive juices and the digestive enzymes which were not used in the process of digestion so all these waste products from the small intestine they will be pushed into the large intestine now large intestine actually the length is less the length is smaller but then the diameter is larger the diameter is more so it is called as the large intestine now the main function of the large intestine is temporarily storing the waste products which it has gathered from the small intestine so the unwanted undigested food it will go on accumulating into the large intestine temporarily it will be stored there and also the excess water from this unwanted food or from the digestive enzymes from the digestive juices it will be absorbed back into our body because water is vital water is important for the body so it will try to avoid throwing this water outside the body so another function we can mention is absorption of water is the function in large intestine and then one important structure what we mentioned the liver actually when the food is absorbed from the small intestine it enters into the blood and this blood takes the food actually to the liver and then the liver it checks the quality of the food it metabolizes the food and if necessary it will store some food in the liver and the remaining food is then utilized by the body cells for the production of energy there are multiple functions of the liver but then as far as the digestive system is concerned we can mention that it is synthesis or it is production of bile which is utilized 
in the digestion of fat. Then at the same time, detoxification is very, very important. It detoxifies the drugs, but at the same time, if there are some toxic substances entering from the food into our system, that toxic substances will also be detoxified by the liver. And this is a 24-hour process. The liver is functioning 24 hours a day. So the process of detoxification is actually going on 24 hours a day in our body. If you improve the blood circulation in the liver, around the liver, this process of detoxification will be enhanced. So, yogic practices would help in that condition. Like simple movements of the diaphragm, deep breathing, that can help to improve blood circulation around the liver. Practices like Agnisar, fire stimulating technique, they help to improve the blood circulation in the liver. The functioning of the liver can be improved with yogic practices and the process of detoxification can be enhanced with the yogic practices. And then of course the other function, important function related with the digestive system is storage of the food. Storage of glucose for example, storage of vitamins it can be done in the liver. Of course, the food is metabolized, the food is converted into the storage form and then it is stored. Then the gallbladder, the small portion what we mentioned. So it's actually the storage, then there is nothing more about it. It's only the function is to store the bile, or to store the secretion of the liver and it is supplied to the digestive system whenever necessary. And the next gland, the pancreas, very important gland which secretes the enzyme insulin. And this insulin, it actually helps in controlling the blood sugar level. So if the insulin is faulty, if the insulin is not produced properly, if it is not produced in necessary quantities, then the blood sugar level increases and the disease what we call is diabetes. So it is related to the gland which is behind our stomach, behind our uh, small intestine and that's called as the pancreas. This was about the main points about the digestive system and some of its application to the yogic practices. So we stop here. Hari Om.